when I was quite young, my great-grandmother gave me advice on how to catch a bird. She said, if you can sprinkle salt on a bird's tail, you can catch it. Did, did any of you ever receive advice like that from a parent or a grandparent? Anyone? Okay, a few of you have. You know, it's, it must be a generational thing. Maybe 40, 50 years ago, people were much more naive than they are today. But my brother and I believe that. And so we could be seen walking around in our grandma's yard, salt shaker in hand. Here, birdie, birdie. We never were successful in applying salt to a bird's tail. And we never caught a bird. In later years, as I got a little older, a little bit more educated, I wondered about the science behind that claim that my grandmother had made. And so I asked her about it. And when I pinned her down, she said, well, if you can get a bird to sit still long enough, you can sprinkle salt on its tail, then it'll sit there long enough for you to catch it. Oh, so it wasn't about the salt at all. I then wondered how many hours of amusement we provided our grandmother as she watched out the window. You've likely been given plenty of advice through the years. Some of it was sound advice and some of it wasn't. Here are some examples of both. This is sound advice actually for parents of toddlers. Only serve spaghetti on bath nights. That's good advice, isn't it? Maybe if you ladies have a husband who is a very sloppy eater, that's good advice for you as well. Now, don't point to him. That's not nice. <laughs> Here's some sound advice for us all. Never trust an electrician with no eyebrows. Right? I mean, if he wires hot and he's not very good at it, you're going to be able to read it all over his face. That's good advice. Here's some advice for you husbands. Hold your wife's hand at the mall. Because if you let go, she'll start shopping. <laughs> now, that's both romantic advice and economic advice. And which of those appeals to you the most probably depends on how long you have been married. I'm just going to throw this out for your consideration, not for advice I would give to anybody. Bank loans require you to pay for 30 years, while robbery will put you behind bars for 10 years. You do the math. <laughs> we probably ought to add a disclaimer to that. Don't try this at home, that kind of a disclaimer. Here's advice I also wouldn't recommend, probably not good advice. When you see someone crying, ask if it's because of their haircut. Oh, that wouldn't go over too well, would it? That's just mean, so don't take that advice. Some of the advice we're given, we ought to take, and some of it we shouldn't. And we have to know, have the wisdom to distinguish between the two. Before Joshua led the Israelite people into the promised land, God gave him sound advice on being a leader of that nation of people. But before we actually read the advice God gave him, let's set a little background for the story. The books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers tell the story of God's people, Israel, escaping Egypt and making their way, their way through the desert to, toward the land that God had promised to give them as their own. All along the way, those people complained and grumbled every time they encountered difficulty. Over and over again, they blamed God. They even went to the extent of, ex of accusing him of leading them out into the desert to die. Several times, those people stated that they would rather go back to Egypt and live there in slavery than to die of thirst or starvation in this God-forsaken place. They couldn't see very far into the future. They did not trust God with it. Each time, God worked some miracle and provided what they needed. He was patient with them, knowing that they had lived in hopelessness their entire lives in Egypt. They had been oppressed and demoralized by the Egyptian people. As a result, they had no faith. All they had known was to give up and to concede defeat, and that was their default. They had been programmed for resignation. 
So God showed them his power over and over again through miracle after miracle. He was trying to teach them to trust him, but they could not. They were small thinkers, and they could not trust in a big God. After a few months in the desert, they finally came to the border of the promised land, and God told them to go in and take it from the people who were living there. God told them he would go with them and provide them victory. God knew that those people who lived there, the Canaanite people, were an immoral and pagan people. And God envisioned that land as being a place where a holy nation would be developed and godly people would live. But Israel hesitated. They were afraid. They could not trust God. They finally decided to send spies into the land to bring back some kind of an intelligence report so they would know a little bit more about the land that God was leading them into before they actually committed to going there. They sent 12 spies, and the spies came back, and this was part of their report as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 25. Taking with them some of the fruit of the land, they brought it down to us and reported, it is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. It's a good land God's leading us to. It really is, they said, the land of milk and honey. But then they added this in verse 28. But the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. The Anakites were a tribe of giant people. They they were somehow genetically predisposed to be abnormally large. 400 years after this time, David would fight one of them when he was a teenage boy, a man named Goliath. He was of the tribe of Anak. The Bible says he was nine and a half feet tall. And so a whole whole army, a whole tribe of these people intimidated these Jewish people. They were not sure that they wanted to go into this land. But Moses tried to encourage them to go in. God will be with you, he said. And Moses said this in verses 29 through 31. Do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God is going before you. Will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son. All the way you went until you reached this place. But they would not be persuaded. They defaulted to their hopeless and thankless, faithless mentality. They were unable to think big. God could not build a kingdom of people with people like that. And so he turned them back to the desert. God declared that that entire adult generation, ages 20 and below, would live for the rest of their lives out in the desert. God would not attempt to go to lead his people into the promised land again until all those faithless and hopeless people had died. God declared because of their fear and lack of faith, they would not receive his blessing. That's an important principle for us to remember. So I'm going to repeat it. God declared that because of their fear and lack of faith, they would not receive his blessing. Now, two of those spies actually were men of faith, Joshua and Caleb. They, along with Moses, tried to persuade the people to go into the land, trust God, follow him. He would provide, but they were unsuccessful. However, because of their faith, God pronounced that Joshua and Caleb alone, of all of that entire generation of adults, would go into the promised land. And so 40 years went by, wandering in the desert, until all of that generation of adults, except for Joshua and Caleb, had passed away. And now it was time for a new generation of faith-filled people to complete God's plan for Israel. Moses, too, had died, and Joshua was a new leader of Israel, and Caleb was one of his generals. And so they found themselves once again, 40 years later, on the border of the promised land. And God spoke to his new leader, Joshua, and gave him some advice. Let's begin to read that in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. 
After the death of Moses, the Lord said to Joshua, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give you. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. And then God made this promise to Joshua in verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then God gave this call to Joshua as the leader of his people in verses 6 through 9. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be able to do, to may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God calls his people to faith and to careful obedience. We're actually going to cover this story in two Sundays as we resume our sermon series on what are you thinking. Next week we will study God's call to Joshua to think right, that is, in obedience to God's will. Today we're going to look at God's call to Joshua to think big. In faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith for us when it says, Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This tells us that we must serve God by reaching for what can only be seen in the dreams and the visions that he gives us for his church. I have discovered through the years that God dreams big and he wants us to dream big and to have a big faith it took an army of big faith people to follow God's battle plan against Jericho when they finally got into the promised land the, the army marched around the city walls for seven days blowing trumpets the walls were massive they could not breach them on their own and on that final day, after the trumpets were blown, the people raised their voices in shout as one, and God caused the walls to crumble, and the army was able to go inside the city and conquer it. Big faith trusted that battle plan. It took soldiers of big faith to march all night to fight against a coalition of five kings and their armies without resting. They were tired when they arrived, but they went forward with God's plan. And because they had faith in him, God rained down hailstones on the enemy army, killing most of them. And then a few weeks later, when 21 kings and their armies, who were described as numerous as the sand on the seashore, gathered to fight against Israel, God's people once again clung to a big faith and defeated them all. And then Joshua led his troops against several armies comprised of the Anakites, those giant warriors the ancestors of Goliath. They were the same army that had discouraged Israel from entering the promised land 40 years before. But now Israel embraced a big faith and they defeated those fearsome warriors. In each of those battles, Scripture tells us that God gave them the victory. We serve a God who fights our battles for us. Therefore, our success does not depend upon our big skills. It depends upon a big faith in a big God. And we can trust Him 
He is a God of power and might, a God who brings his will to be, a God who builds his kingdom no matter who opposes it. None of those pagan armies could stand against God's plans. Jesus later said, even the very gates of hell cannot stand against God's kingdom when it advances. He will always prevail with that understanding. Let's read again the promise God made to Joshua in Joshua 1.5. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that God is our God. And that promise is ours. It is just as trustworthy and unfailing to us. Some of the best advice I ever received when I began in this profession was this. When you dream for God's church, dream big. Have big visions. Live by a big faith. God calls us to succeed in our work for him, to dream big, to trust big, and then work hard to make those dreams a reality. Sometimes in the discussion about faith, that, that working hard part gets brushed aside as if we expect that God will do all the work while we just sit back and watch. Nothing could be further from the truth. It took the armies of Israel to fight those battles empowered by God, aided by God. It took the apostles in the later centuries, uh, centuries later to build God's church empowered by his Holy Spirit, aided by that spirit. But God has always worked in partnership with his people, providing them the power. Do you remember the parable of the talents that Jesus taught? It's about a king representing God, who called in three servants, representing us, and gave each of them talents, representing some kind of a trust, that is, an ability or a responsibility that God gives us. He expected them to succeed and to prosper with that trust. After a long time, he called them in to give account for what they had done with that which he had entrusted to them. Two of those servants were successful. They achieved growth and prospered. But the third was afraid of failing. He did not focus on prospering. Instead, he focused on returning the trust without losing it. He did not work with that trust he failed. The king called him wicked and lazy, and he received none of the king's blessings. If you have been given a ministry of some sort, God has given you a trust. If you have been given children to raise, God has given you a trust. If you have been given some responsibility in God's church or received any kind of a call from God, that is a trust from him. Have a big faith and carry out that trust as someone who is working to succeed and prosper God's kingdom with it. If you step out in faith God will go with you and bless your efforts. So think big, dream big, and have a big faith in the big God. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. When Holly and I came to this church 35 years ago, we reached for what was hoped for, but not yet seen. This church had not grown to be the church that was envisioned when it had been planted seven years before that. There was doubt that it ever would be. It was still about the same size then that it was seven years before. I had never built a church from the ground floor 
when I came here. I had never led a church through a building program. I had never helped a church raise the hundreds of thousands of dollars that would be needed to accomplish that. I had never led a church to change its music style and to market itself to a younger generation. I had never mentored a leadership to take the church into a new future. I had never helped a church structure all the programming it would need to successfully minister to its community. I had no experience in any of that. But I had faith and a strong work ethic. The kind of faith that assures us that if we are doing God's work, he is in it with us. The kind of faith that tells us we don't know, need to know where all the resources are coming from. We just need to know the God who does. And fortunately, enough people in this church had that same kind of faith. And we took a leap of faith. Not the kind of leap that's tethered to a bungee cord or one over a safety net. There was no guarantee of a soft landing or a safe landing for us. Our security was in God alone. And I have learned that that is enough. We thought big. And we stepped out in faith. And we worked hard. And God blessed our efforts. You do the same. Step out. In fact, leap out in faith as you follow God. Work hard, and God will bless that commitment to his will. He is a big God. Let's read how the apostle Paul described him in Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, not just more, but immeasurably more, immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine, According to his power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church. How can we think small when we serve a big God like that? If we think small, we limit ourselves. And more importantly, we limit what God can do through us. The one difference between the Israel which stood at the border of the promised land with Moses... And the Israel which stood at that same border with Joshua 40 years later, the one difference between those two groups was faith. The first group had little. And as a result, they were unable to trust God. They were small thinkers. God could not build his kingdom with people like that. The second group, their children, had developed a big faith. Throughout their entire lives, they had seen God provide for them on a daily basis. They had seen God protect them time after time. They had seen his miracles. They grew up trusting God. They were able to think big, and they followed God wherever he led. And that made all the difference in their future. You see, it's not the size of your call that depend, determines whether or not you will be successful. And it's not even the size of the challenges you will face. But it is the size of your faith that makes a difference. Be people of big faith. Six years ago, I called on our congregation to develop a vision for a greater future. I challenge us to reach goals in four areas. The first was for us to reach out more effectively into our communities, more purposefully for Jesus. And we have. Our vacation Bible school program, our celebration in the park program have grown and improved. And recently we have added Connect Crew to our outreach program. Many of our members are involved in leading Bible studies at Louisville Elementary School. God bless you for your efforts. You are making a huge difference. Secondly, I called on our congregation to implement an elder and deacon, deacon training program, and we did, and we have added to our leadership as a result, and I am so impressed with the big faith I see in those leaders. Thirdly, I challenged our congregation to add to our staff, and we did that as well. We now have two part-time children's directors, and we've approved a 
search for a full-time youth minister to free Tony up to do worship as a full-time ministry. And our children's ministry has become hugely successful. And finally, I challenged our congregation to raise our giving by 15% in order to fund those goals. And in the six years since that time, our giving has increased by 54%. People with big faith are investing in this ministry. We believe in what this church is doing and we are helping to make it successful. Let's always be a people who think big. I call on our leaders to continue thinking big as we progress into the future. Let's never be the kind of church that fails to move forward because we are afraid to take big steps. Let's step out in faith on our big God. And I call on our members to grow the kind of faith that thinks big. The comfortable thing to do is to just... Try to do what we know we can achieve. That's not faith. Faith is daring to step out of our comfort zone and to achieve in extraordinary ways. Practice that kind of faith as you serve God. Think big for him. And finally, I challenge our teenagers to learn to think big. Set great goals for yourselves Aspire to rise above mediocrity. In your schoolwork, make top grades your goal. In your sports or your music or your drama pursuits, drive yourself to be the best you can be. And in your spiritual life, grow in your knowledge of God's word and serve him with your best efforts. Get involved in our youth program so that you can develop that kind of faith. Learn to step out in that faith and aspire to greater heights and that will serve you well in every future endeavor. There is no limit to what God can do through us if we dare to think big. Let's train ourselves to do that. Thinking big is crucial to succeeding. It's been said, don't be afraid to take a big step if one is indicated. You cannot cross a chasm in two small leaps. Oh, we can just be dependable. But as God's people, we are capable of much more than that. Don't settle for being the person about whom it is said, well, he never accomplished much of anything noteworthy, but he was always there when you needed him. There is value in dependability, in being there, But there is greater value in a life which aspires to more. Be the person about whom it is said he never gave up reaching for the stars. His achievements rank in the stratosphere. Rise above small thinking. Will we sometimes fail while we are aiming big? Yes. But the more important fact is, we will sometimes succeed. And isn't that exciting? And in God's judgment, according to the parable of the talents, failure is not falling short while trying. Failure is to not try at all. Three times in God's instructions to Joshua, he said, be strong and courageous. It was the call to trust God with a big faith. And God put a parenthetical promise around that threefold call. And that promise was, I will be with you always. I am calling you to a big faith. A faith big enough to accomplish the miraculous. A faith big enough to make a difference. A faith that can move mountains. But if you're not a Christian, I'm calling you to... An even bigger faith than that. A faith that lets go of trusting yourself and puts your trust completely in Jesus as your Savior. Let him save you and let him grant you God's blessings. Embrace the big God and live for him in big ways.
Let's stand as we sing our invitation hymn.